John chapter number five. First John chapter number five. Towards the end of your New Testament, First John chapter number five. Now today I want to preach a little bit different type of sermon. I want the title of the sermon tonight is called So Winning Do's and Don'ts. So winning do's and don'ts. Now the Bible says in Second Timothy chapter three, uh, for all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Now tonight is gonna be a more of an instructional sermon. Now before I preach or say anything, let me just make two d- disclaimers. If anything I say that is different than what Pastor says, he's right and I'm wrong. And the second disclaimer is, if your soul winning method is effective, you don't have to change your method. Now, the only reason I want to share with you is I believe I have some kind of experience in dealing with different kind of people, in going door to door and sharing the gospel. So if you want to learn, if you want to know about my method, more than, you're more than welcome to take notes. I will slow myself down so you don't have to listen to the live stream again. And uh, so... Point number one, by the way, I, I only have 10, 10 points written on this sheet, so it uh, should be really quick and simple. Now, point number one, don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Now, when we knock on the doors, there are, there are one question we always ask, right? If you happen to die today, do you know for sure that you are going to heaven? And someone may tell you, of course, believe because I believe Jesus Christ died for me and He rose from the dead. Is that person saved or not saved? Now, my now my initial response is I don't really know for sure because there are a lot of times, a lot of times people who have gone so winning can testify. Sometimes people may answer that question by I believe totally by faith, believe on Jesus Christ, but I always follow up with the next question: Do you believe you can lose it if you do something bad? Do you believe God can take away your salvation if you mess up your life? Now, a lot of times people, people will answer yes to the first question. They believe they are saved, they are going to heaven by faith, by grace alone. But then I ask him, do you believe you can lose it? And someone will tell me, you have to keep doing the right thing. God can take away your salvation. I have to keep repenting, I have to keep confessing. Now, that person is not saved. So. My first point is, don't conclude somebody is saved too early, because a lot of times we only ask one question, right? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? If someone gave you the answer by grace, through faith, I can't, uh, it's only by Jesus Christ, a lot of people will conclude that person is saved, but personally, I always follow up with the next question. Do you believe God can take away your salvation if you sin, if you do something really bad? And that question really can give someone's true belief on salvation. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 10. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God had the witness in himself. He that believeth not God had made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So the Bible says, if you don't believe the record that God had given his Son, you have made God a liar. Now what is this record? The Bible says in verse number 11, and this is the record that God had given to us, what? Eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So if someone just flat out don't believe in the eternal security of the believers, that person is not saved. Now, I get it, people can be confused, but if someone flat out says they can lose their salvation, they have to keep doing good things to keep being saved, that person is not saved. So, when you go soul winning, number one, don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Some, a lot of times, again, people who have been so with me, with me can, testify, can, can testify. A lot of times they answer good on the first question. By grace through faith, sounds all good. But do you believe you can lose it? Yes, we can. And then we dig deeper to find out that person is not really saved. Because a lot of people think getting saved is free, but in order to keep being saved, you have to work for it. So be very careful to don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. And what I do is I always ask two questions. Number one, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you are going to heaven? And if they answered right on on the first question, I always follow up with the next question. Do you believe you can lose your salvation if you sin? 
Do you believe uh, you can lose your salvation if you do something bad? So point number two, don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. Now, don't assume somebody know what the definition of sin, hell, Jesus is. Don't assume that. Because a lot of times, they don't even know who Jesus is, right? They don't even know what the sin is. So ask someone, after you've shown them for the wages of sin is death, ask them, do you know what a sin is? Is it transgression against the law? Talk about uh, stealing, lying, murder? Always ask them, always explain the terms clearly. Don't assume they know everything. Tell, always tell them what hell is. Hell is lake of fire. Always tell them who Jesus is. Now, the thing about Jesus is very important because actually go to 2 John chapter 1. 2 John chapter number 1. 2 John chapter number 1. Now, the thing about Jesus is a lot of people, they can believe on Jesus Christ. They can believe that Jesus Christ died for them and rose from the dead. And a lot of people think that person is saved. But the, but the problem is a lot of people believe Jesus Christ is just a man, but not God in the flesh. Now, this is very important. Because the Bible says in 2 John chapter 1, verse number 7, 2 John chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the what? In the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, a lot of people believe in Jesus only as a man. Not believe in Jesus as a God in the flesh. Now, this is important because some people can believe Jesus is a man and they trust in Him. Is that person saved? No. They have to believe Jesus Christ is deity, as God in the flesh. Otherwise, the Bible called them a deceiver and an antichrist. So when you share the person of Jesus Christ, don't pause that. Ask them, do you believe Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? Ask that question. Don't just assume they know Jesus Christ is God, because somebody can believe Jesus Christ is a man, and that person is going to hell. So make sure you explain Jesus Christ is God in, in the flesh, the deity of Christ, because if someone does not confess he came in the flesh, then he's a deceiver and antichrist, and he's not saved. Don't assume anything. Explain what the resurrection is, the death, burial, and resurrection. Don't assume everybody knows Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Don't assume that because a lot of people, especially young people, they have no idea that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So, what I'm preaching today, tonight I'm preaching about soul winning do's and don'ts. Number one, don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Number two, don't assume anything. Number three, don't move on to the next point until the previous point it is, is clear. Don't move on to the next point until the previous point is clear. What do I mean by that? Usually when we go soul winning, we share the Romans show, right? We believe we are a sinner, and sin des we all deserve to go to hell. Jesus Christ died for us, and we have to confess, believe in our heart, and, and ask Jesus for salvation. Now, don't move on to the second point until the previous point is clear. Here's what I, what I meant by that. The reason you want to do that is you want to avoid at the end of the conversation when you're about to lead someone to the Lord and they will tell you, no, I don't really believe that. That happens a lot of times because if you don't explain someone deserves to go to hell at the end of the conversation when you're about to lead them to the Lord, you will ask them, do you believe you deserve to go to hell? No, I don't. See, what's the point? You're wasting so much time, and you, you, you've gone nowhere. So don't move on to the next point until the previous point is, is clear. Don't move on to the punishment of sin without establishing that person is a sinner. Don't move on to Jesus Christ die for you until you've established, or at least have gone through, that you, the punishment of sin is death and hell. Don't move on to the next point until the previous point is cleared. Otherwise, at the end of the conversation, you will have a really tough time if someone is not clear on one point and you've hindered that person's salvation. So don't move on to the next point until the previous point is cleared. Number four, don't feed answers. Don't feed someone answers. Now this is huge because a lot of time I, I've seen people come so winning. Um, you know they'll they'll say something like this. You know what a sin is, right? It's anything. It's anything that bad we do. You know the way to sin is death. You deserve to go to hell, right? You know that Jesus Christ died for us. Okay, you you have to trust him. Let me pray for you. <laughs> 
<laughs> this is called quick prayism. No, easy prayism. Anyway. <laughs> now, we don't believe in one, two, three, repeat after me for a reason because you don't want to feed someone answers because when you do something like that, somebody might not really believe what you're talking about. Now, go to Revelation chapter, chapter 21. Revelation 21. Revelation 21. Now, one way to avoid doing that is ask, ask them questions and pause. Let them think. For example, the, the, the way, the way I, 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 I make people realize that they deserve to go to hell is first, I establish we are all sinners. You know, even just a lie is a sin. And I always lead them to Revelation chapter 21, verse number 8. Revelation 21, verse number 8, the Bible says, but the fearful, and the unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and, and idolaters, and notice, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, according to the Bible, looks like everyone deserves to go to hell. Even a liar deserves to go to hell. Now, I've told a lie before. So, according to the Bible, where do I deserve to go when I die? So when I share that point, I, I always point to myself first. To, I, I, I mean, I, I always admit, I myself deserve to go to hell first to make them more comfortable. So, so, so they'll, they'll, they'll tell me, according to the Bible, I deserve to go to hell. Now, you have told a lie before, right? So according to this verse, where do you deserve to go when we die? And I pause. Don't feed answers. Someone has to get that in order to be saved. If someone don't believe they deserve to go to hell, like why, do, why do we need to get saved in the first place? Now, a lot of people, they skip that part. A lot of people just say, you deserve to die. I don't, I don't think that that's enough, because dying can mean physical death, spiritual death, right? The Bible referring to the lake of fire as the second death. So always, don't just pass through the hell part. Now, hell is a Bible word. In soul winning, it's totally fine to use that word. And in fact, if you don't use the word hell in soul winning, you don't really love that person. Okay? Now, so, so don't just pause. Don't just stop at admitting they deserve to die. Move on. They deserve to die and go to hell. Make them admit that they deserve to go to hell. The best way is ask the question, do you believe that? And pause. Let them think. Let them respond. If someone is not clear, explain that point again. Then move on to the next point. Same thing with Jesus Christ. You can ask them, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? And you pause. Don't feed the answers. Don't feed the answer. Make sure somebody is really getting the point. Do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? And you pause. The best way to move on from point to point is ask one question before you move on to the next point. The first point is we've all sinned, right? Do you believe you are a sinner? Yes. Now let's talk about hell. Do you believe you deserve to go to hell? Yes. And then, then move on to Jesus Christ die for us. So don't feed answers because when you feed answers, you will have a lot of false converts. And false converts is the, hardest, is the hardest group of people to get saved because they think they are saved. In fact, they are not. You know, people who, who have gone so many know the hardest people uh, that will get saved it is the so-called Christians. So don't give false assurance. Don't do that. Don't feed answers. Don't create false converts. So, I was talking about point number one, don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Number two, don't assume anything. Number three, don't move on to the next point until the previous point is cleared. Number four, don't feed answers. Number five, don't beat a dead horse. Don't beat a dead horse. Now, I get that. You can never be too thorough in sharing the gospel, but there's a point that you've, you will beat a dead horse. Now, here's what I mean. If they get the point you are talking about, move on. Because I've gone so many with someone, I'm not picking on somebody until, unless you're watching, I don't know. Um, <laughs> don't be a dead horse. Now what I mean by that is, a lot of people go so many, they've established someone is a sinner and they admit that. They admit they deserve to go to hell and then someone goes to the Ten Commandments. It's like a checklist. Have you told a lie? Have you disobeyed your parents? I was like, they already know they're going to hell. Time to share the good news, right? 
So there's a point when you are beating a dead horse. If someone get the point, just move on because we don't want to linger in the bad part, in the going to hell part. We want to share about the good news. So as soon as someone get, they are a sinner and they are on their way to hell, move on to the good news. Move on to the good point. Move on to Jesus Christ. Die for it. Don't beat a dead horse. Don't, if someone know, realize they are a sinner, don't check list the Ten Commandments. Don't make them feel bad. I mean, they already feel bad. They already know they're going to hell. So move on, okay? So number five, don't beat a dead horse. Number, number six, don't use confusing terminologies or questions. Don't use confusing terminologies or questions. Go to Jonah chapter three. Jonah chapter number three. Jonah chapter number three. Don't use confusing terminologies or questions. Now let me just make a disclaimer. I know there are a lot of phrases that I'm about to say, people define it differently, so please take a grain of salt. Um, I'm just telling you my personal experience with, with, with these terms during, during the gospel presentation. The term number one, the word repent. Oh, you are denying repentance. No, I'm not. <laughs> because a lot of times people will say you have to repent of your sins to be saved, right? Now I get what that what I get what they what they meant, but I personally want to avoid the phrase repent of your sin because the word repent simply means you, means to turn. Concerning salvation, you don't have to turn from your sins or quit sinning to be saved. That's a works-based salvation. Now, we have to repent to be saved. I'm not denying repentance. Repent simply means to turn. Repent and believe the gospel, right? Repent, repentance from dead works and faith toward Jesus Christ. Now, the phrase, repent of your sin, first, is never found in the Bible. And second, that's not a requirement for salvation. We should turn from our sin every single day as Christians. But concerning salvation, we don't have to turn from our sins to be saved. Now, if you really want to stretch that, the only sin we need to turn is the sin of unbelief concerning salvation. We don't have to turn from our sins, plural, turn over your new leaf. Stop sinning to be saved. Otherwise, that's a workspace salvation. Otherwise, you believe in a lordship salvation. Jonah chapter, Jonah chapter 3, look at verse number 10. Jonah 3, verse number 10. Now, here is why God spared the city of Nineveh. Jonah 3 verse 10, the Bible says, And God saw their, what? Works. works. What are their works? That, that they turn from their evil ways. Translate, they repent from their sins. And God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did not. Now, th this verse just says, If you turn from your sins, turn from your evil ways, can God call it works? So, and salvation is not works. And actually in this verse, the Bible gives you another aspect of repent. And God repented of the evil, right? In the Bible, the person that has done the most repenting is God. Because repentance does not always come with repent of your sin. It simply means to turn. So when you're going soul winning, I'd like to advise you to avoid using the word repent. Not because I deny repentance, but a lot of people associate repentance with Lordship salvation, with turning from your sins, stop sinning to be saved. Again, I get that. People may say that phrase, they don't really mean that. They may mean something different. I totally get that. But concerning salvation, when you're sharing the gospel with unbelievers, you want to be as clear as possible. Use, use the, the clearest term you can ever use. Okay. Now again, a lot of people may twist what I'm, what I'm going to say, but I'm not against repentance. I'm against repent of your sins to be saved. Because repent simply means to turn, to change your mind. Repentance toward God. Now the second, second phrase I want to avoid using is, have a relationship with Jesus. <laughs> have a relationship with Jesus. Now, I get that. I get what they meant by, by, the, by, by what they say. But the, the phrase relationship... In fact, the word relationship is not in the Bible. I get that. We should have a relationship with God. We should have a good relationship with God. But the phrase is confusing to, new, to unbelievers because what do you mean by that? Have a relationship? A good one? A bad one? A divorced one? I have no idea what I meant. And in fact, the Bible never used that, that, that phrase concerning salvation. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Why, why don't you just use the clear phrase in the Bible? Why do you have to invent the phrase, have a relationship and be saved? I don't know what that meant. <laughs> what, what do you mean by having a relationship? Is that work-based work salvation? Do you have to work for that relationship? 
Now I get that Christians should have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. A perfect religion includes good, 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 good relationship with, with, with our Lord Jesus Christ. But you don't have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ to be saved because I don't know what they mean. Okay, I don't, I don't know what that for the first man. So avoid using confusing terminologies. Now the next one. Ask Jesus into your heart. Ask Jesus into your heart. Now first, that, that phrase is not in the Bible. Second, I really don't know what that meant. I mean, I, I get that when the people say the phrase, I know what they meant, but to unbelievers, that phrase is very confusing. But because that phrase implies you can simply pray a mere prayer and be saved. Ask Jesus into your heart. I don't, I don't know what that phrase really means. In fact, when you go so many, why don't you, why don't you just use the biblical phrase, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's simple, right? I mean, it's few words in the first place, and we have to confuse people. Now, there's a question I want to avoid you asking. Again, if you use that in your in your in your presentation and it works, don't please don't change that. But 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 there's a question I've heard multiple times going so many with different people. Is there a point in your life when you ask Jesus into your heart? Is there a point in your life when you get saved? Now, I get that. There's a point. It's okay to ask that question, but but here. But, but here's the problem. When you knock on someone's door and someone told you they have no idea where they're going to go, you know that person is not safe, right? So why are you asking the question? <laughs> is there a point in your life when you ask Jesus and be saved? If you know someone is not safe in the first place, why are you asking that question? Now the problem with that is, you know that someone is not saved because they told you they have to work their way to heaven and you share the whole gospel at the end of the presentation. You're about to lead, lead that person to the Lord and you ask them, is there a point in your life when you get saved? The problem is a lot of people will say yes, <laughs> even if you know they are not saved. So why don't you just avoid that question in the first place? If you know that someone is not saved, don't, why are you asking that question? If you are clear that person is trusting your works, there's no point to ask that question. In fact, there are so many times, myself included, in my early days of soul winning, I asked that. And they tell me, yes, in fact, I knew from the beginning they were not saved. And then it just made the conversation so much more di difficult. Now, the thing I do personally is, at the beginning of the conversation, I will ask them, what do you think someone have to do to go to heaven? And they will tell me, you have to keep going to church, you have to keep doing good works, okay? And then I share the whole gospel. And then at the end of the conversation, I will ask that person, when I first came here, you told me you have to work to go to heaven, right? Now, according to the Bible, it says something different. It's only by faith, it's only by believing. Would you say that you've changed your mind? It works perfectly. And someone, if you have counseling with me, you, 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 can, you can testify that it works. Now notice I didn't use the word repent, I used the phrase, Did you, would you believe, would you think you've changed your mind? And a lot of people would say yes. And then I would, I'll, I'll probably lead them to a prayer, make sure they really believe. I'll, I'll, I'll ask them some questions to make sure they believe in everything. But that question is so good. Let me, let me just say that, um, rephrase that question again. When I first came here, you told me it's by works. Now the Bible says something different. Would you say you've changed your mind? If someone says yes, that's perfect. You can move on to the next point. And that really works, okay? Now, point number seven. Do share eternal security. Do share eternal security. Now, I get that. If you don't share eternal security, someone can still get saved. I get that. But by sharing the eternal security along with the gospel presentation, it, it just improves so much more. Because we, are, we, we believe in, in an eternal salvation. We believe in an eternal salvation. And by sharing the eternal security that salvation lasts forever, rather than discipling them after they are saved, it will really hammer the point of by grace through faith. It's, it will really hammers that point by grace through faith. Now, now the illustration that I always use is a gift illustration. I will ask that person, if I give you a gift, who pays for the gift? Me or you? They will say me. So the giver pays for the gift. Then who gives us eternal life? Jesus Christ. So he is the giver. So he already paid for that on the cross. 
Now, if I give you a gift and I say you have to give me ten bucks, is that a gift? No, it's not a gift. If I give you a gift, you have to wash my car. Is that a gift? Not a gift. Same thing with going to heaven. If God says going to heaven is a gift, you have to go to church every week. Is that a gift? No, it's not a gift. Okay, and the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. How long is it eternal? It's forever. So, if I give you a gift, can I ever take that back? No. Why? Because you said forever. What if you do something really bad? Can you take it away? No, because you said it's forever. And then I will explain to them, God will punish you if you do something bad, but God is like a loving father who will chastise you, but when, if you are truly saved, He will never cast you to hell. So I always share that point of eternal security to make sure they believe by being saved, getting saved is only by faith, and you don't have to do good works to keep being saved. Because this point is huge, because a lot of times can believe a lot of people believe they can uh, go to heaven simply by grace through faith, but they believe you have to keep working to keep being saved. So keep watching out for that because that is a huge point. So what have I talked about tonight? Number one, don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Number two, don't assume anything. Number three, don't move on to the next point until the previous point is clear. Number four, don't feed answers. Number five, don't beat a dead horse. Number six, don't use confusing terminologies or questions. Number seven, do share eternal security. Point number eight, do share the, the concept of repentance. Again, I've already touched, touched on that, but number, number, number point is, number, number eight is do share the concept of, of repentance because repentance is an aspect of salvation. You don't want to... You don't want to wait till the end of the conversation and someone tell you ever or they believe that. Because that happened a lot. You know, you know that you know someone is not saved and they share the whole gospel and then someone tell you, I've already believed that. <laughs> that happens so many times. And, and, and again, the way to avoid that is ping their answer down in the very beginning. When I first came here, you told me it's by works, right? And they say yes. Always use, use their answer against them at the very beginning. Because if you don't do that, at the end, if they tell you, I've already believed that. That will just make the conversation so much harder. Because you know that person is not safe. Point number nine. Go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter number 10. Point number nine. Do lead someone with a prayer. Do lead someone with a prayer. Now, someone may accuse me for saying that. They, 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 will, they will accuse me by saying, You mind to tell me I can pray a prayer and be saved? Yes. <laughs> yes. Romans chapter 10, look at verse number 9. Romans 10, verse number 9. The Bible says that if, so that's you, that's your choice, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, men believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth, don't miss this, confession is made unto salvation. So can someone get saved with a prayer? Absolutely. But the catch is, you have to believe in your heart. Right? And because in the whole passage, the Bible, the Bible gives you a heart and mouth connection. Right? The reason you pray, the reason you ask God is because you believe in the first place. Notice in verse number 11. For the scripture said, Whosoever believeth in, on him shall not be ashamed. Now there are so many interpretations on that verse, but I believe one application is, if someone truly believes, they should not be ashamed to ask him. Right? Again, the word ashamed can mean let down, can mean uh, let, left hang. But I believe one of the primary applications, the reason it follow after verse number 10 is, I believe if someone truly believes, they should not be ashamed to ask, to call, to, uh, to ask Jesus to save them. Because with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Verse number 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So can someone pray a prayer and be saved? Absolutely. But they have to believe in the first place. Now, what I always do is I always explain the purpose of a prayer. Before I lead someone to a prayer, I will, I, I will always tell them, you know, it's not really the word you say, it's your belief in your heart. But I, but I just want to help you to ask Jesus what you just told me. And then if you don't believe what I say, don't repeat after me. I mean, I mean, I always say that phrase. I always say that last phrase because a lot of times, you know, you will, you will ask them to repeat your prayer. 
Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner and, I, I'm, 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 and I'm on my way to hell. And then they'll tell me, I don't really believe that. <laughs> so that is the best, if that's the best method to catch someone truly believe or not at the last moment. So always tell them, you know, if you don't believe what I say, don't repeat after me. Just tell them, okay? But always explain the purpose of the prayer, but do lead someone with a prayer. Now here's a problem. I do believe someone has to pray, has to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now, here's why. Someone can believe Jesus Christ died for them. It's for free, it's forever. But if they don't ask them, how do they get, get, how do they get that gift in the first place? Here's the gift. You believe it's forever, it's by grace, it's free. How do you get it? Ask for it. Because someone can believe that, if they don't ask, that gift is still, still not theirs. That's why I believe someone do someone does have to pray to be saved. Now, the word call upon the name of the Lord is, is really a heart and mouth connection, so don't falsely accuse me on that. Now, here's a test, okay? If someone believes and they pray, that person is saved, right? If someone believes and they don't pray, we don't really know, <laughs> right? We don't really know. Or that person is really an idiot. <laughs> they know the free gift they don't ask for it, right? Now, if someone don't believe and, and if someone pray, that person is not saved. Now, the catch is, you know, again, I say if someone believe and don't pray, we don't, we don't really know. They might, they might call upon uh, the Lord in their heart. We don't really know. So my personal uh, way of, 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 of counting salvation, again, we, we don't care about numbers. I get that. But my personal way of counting salvation is if someone believe and don't pray, I won't count that person as salvation. I will follow up, but, but I won't proclaim someone as saved. Now, point number 10, very quickly. Go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. So I've talked about point number one. Don't conclude somebody is saved too quickly. Number two, don't assume anything. Number three, don't move on to the next point until the previous point is clear. Number four, don't feed answers. Number five, don't beat a dead horse. Number six, don't use confusing terminologies. Number seven, do share eternal security. Number eight, do share the concept of repentance. Number nine, do lead someone with a prayer. Number ten, do realize that soul winning is essential. Do you realize that soul winning is essential? The bars are not essential. I don't know why they're still open with a long line, but you know, the, pro the, the point of this is if the government shutting down churches, if the government tell you reading your Bible, soul winning, praying is illegal, we should still do it. Okay, in Acts chapter 5, look at verse 28. Acts chapter 5, verse 28. The Bible says, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Upon us. So Peter and the other apostles is being accused. They've been commanded not to preach the gospel, right? And because they filled Jerusalem with the gospel, and, and the response of Peter in verse 29, the Bible says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Okay, the context of that phrase is directly associated with preaching the gospel. So if someone tells you uh, the coronavirus is shutting, shutting the soul winning down, we should still do it. Because soul winning is essential. Now this is the exact problem Peter and the early church went through uh, in the book of Acts. You know, Pete, they have, they have been constantly persecuted by the Jews about sharing the gospel, but they've, they've chosen to obey God rather than men. And and like them, we should feel Indianapolis with the doctrine, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just do a quick math. I've heard a preacher done that illustration, and I thought it's very neat. Um, so many believers, if one person lead another person to the Lord in the entire year, right? You got two people, right? Make sense? One plus one is two. Now, the next year... That two, that two people each lead another person to the Lord. How many people we have in the second year? Four. What about the third year? Two to the third power, right? That would be eight, right? In the fourth year, how many? Sixteen, right? Fifth year, thirty-two. And we have six year, uh, uh, and then six year we have sixty-four. Now after ten years, one person leading another person to the Lord in the entire year, which is really doable, right? So after 10 years, we got a thousand people. 
Now in 20 years, we will have a million people because of the exponential growth. Now, in 33 years, we will have 8.6 billion people evangelized. One person get, another person saved. In the entire year, after 33 years, 8.6 billion people saved. Now, there are only 7.6 billion people in the entire world. <laughs> now, this, this math just tells you most Christians, 99% of Christians, are not sharing the gospel. Because if one person has done that for the entire year and trained another person to share the gospel, in 33 years, the whole world will be evangelized. I'm not saying the whole world will be saved, because the whole world will never be saved, but at least they've heard they will hear about the gospel. So my last point is very simple. Do you realize that soul winning is essential? Because the purpose, the purpose, the God's way of evangelizing, of reaching the lost is through the local church. And local church is sending you out to share the gospel. And every Saturday and every Wednesday and all the other days of the week, you can contact pastor. I'm sure he'll find you a spot to plug in to share the gospel. So tonight... I talk about soul winning do's and don'ts. So again, like I said in the beginning, if your soul winning method is proven effective, you don't have to change anything, but if you feel like you're struggling at your soul winning, if you feel like you want to uh, listen to other people's opinion, um, I, I would really recommend you to, to, to take some notes uh, of, of my points. So let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thanks so much for tonight. I pray that will, you will light a fire in us to share the gospel, especially in this time, Lord. And pe people are scared, people, pe people are doing stupid things, people are making an um, unreasonable mandate and laws, Lord. I pray you'll stop this stupidity. But more importantly, Lord, help us just fill the city, heal, fill the country with the gospel. So people will realize that there is hope, there's no reason to fear. And I pray this in Jesus' name.